Hello, my name is Eric Green, and welcome to this course on using React with Redux. We're going to walk you through the process of how to incorporate React components into your Redux application. This course is brought to you by Wintelect Now. In this course, we're going to start off by talking about two kinds of components, presentational and container components. Both of these will, in fact, be React components, but how we use React to build these components and their roles and purposes will be be discussed. Next we're going to take a look at how to use Redux with React. Great minds think alike. React and Redux are very similar in some of the ways that they approach working with uh, changes to state and uh, and so because of that they, they, they work together very very well. Next we'll take a look at how to set up a React Redux project. We will be using TypeScript in this course. If you're just using JavaScript for your applications, you should be able to, to follow along very nicely with all, of the, uh, with, with, with all of the content, but we are going to be using TypeScript. Next, we're going to take a look at how to connect a React presentational component to a Redux store. Then we're going to take a look at accessing REST service data with Redux Thunk. And then finally, we're going to pass the Redux store to all of our React container components using the provider component. So what is the difference between a presentational and container component? First of all, both of them are going to be actual React components. It just boils down to what are we actually going to be doing with those components. Uh, no doubt, in, in most React applications that you've probably built, you had a bunch of React components. They were organized into some type of component tree. And, and those, those components really did probably double duty. They, on one hand, provided a UI piece where people could actually, or users could interact with your actual web page, but they probably also interacted with resources of the application, um, basically allowing it to pull in data, send data out, interact with other services, that kind of thing. The problem with that approach though, the problem with having this UI piece as well as this application piece to our components is that basically it tightly couples our UI components to that particular application. One of the goals with building React, um, React components in general is the ability to reuse those components in multiple applications. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be taking a look at creating these things called container components and differentiating them from what we call presentational components. Basically, presentational components are going to be responsible for displaying the UI portions, actually taking some list of data and then actually building the list. The container component is going to be responsible for getting the list, interacting with application resources to actually pull in that list data and then make it available to the UI component. Because we have only the container component has knowledge of the application, whereas the tree of UI presentational components underneath of it doesn't have to know all of those details. Now typically, container components are really interested in doing two different things. One is subscribing to some type of application state to be, to be notified when things have changed, and then also to be able to dispatch actions triggered by the user so that the application state can be updated um, in response to some type of user interaction. In order for containers, container components to do this, they need some type of mapping logic that allows them to receive application state and forward that on to the presentational components while having access to some type of action dispatcher functions so that the presentational components can trigger those, passing up changes back up to the application itself so that the state can be properly updated. Now presentational components will still receive their application state updates through their props, through the component tree. So the presentational components, nothing's really changing with these other than they're not aware of the application in which they're running. They're just receiving their, their data through their props as usual. In addition to receiving data, they'll also receive a reference to the dispatch function or some type of function wrapping that dispatch function through their props as well. This will ena enable the UI or presentational components to actually trigger some type of action to occur when the user interacts with them. Now the process of passing the dispatch function and other application state data to each child container component can be a bit, te can, can be a bit tedious. Later on in the course, we'll take a look at how we can use React's context feature to be able to pass that down more easily. 
Now let's take a quick look at this diagram and taking, take a look at how we can connect state with components without using a container and some of the downsides of that. As you see here, we have our presentational React component. This is typically how you've been building your applications most likely up to this point. The presentational component has to have knowledge of how to get the actual application state in order to display it on the screen. So the presentational component is locked in to this particular application and how it manages its state in addition to doing its UI responsibilities. Also the presentational component has to know how to dispatch actions with the stores dispatch function which is passed into it. So in this case our presentational component is really responsible for doing two things. It's responsible for displaying the UI stuff as well as actually interacting with the, um, with, with the application itself, um, which of course then tightly couples that component to our particular application. However, if we introduce a container component, let's see what happens. When we introduce the container component, the container component has to have knowledge of how to interact with the application in terms of getting the application state and dispatching the actions. But the presentational component is insulated from the specifics of the application, which makes the presentational component more reusable, especially within the context of other applications, because it doesn't have to know the specifics of how the application store is being managed or how the application's actions are being dispatched. So let's take a look at some code here that actually demonstrates presentational versus container components. Let's take a look at getting our project set up for working through this course. As part of this, we're going to take a look at using a container component to wrap our UI or presentational component. To get things started, I have a project that's been previously prepared. Um, you can get access to it from this URL right here, um, github.com slash training for developers slash using dash react dash with dash redux. I'm going to come over here to our clone or download and we're going to copy the link here. And then we're going to come over to our command prompt and I'm already inside of my folder and I'm going to go ahead and clone this to my local file system here. Excellent, and then I'm going to open up Visual Studio Code. And then I'm going to select my folder here, so I've got it previously opened. So we'll click on it there. And then we have our using React with Redux project. In order to actually make use of this, we'll need to uh, install the node packages. So I'm going to open up my terminal window here. I'm going to say npm i. Okay, so now that we have our packages installed, we can actually go ahead and launch the application just to confirm that everything is working properly. So our web browser should load up here and we should have our data displayed, which we do. So all is looking good. So we're starting off with a working React Redux application, but it's not using any of the Redux or any of the React Redux package stuff we'll be learning about later. What we're going to do in this first little demonstration is we're going to take a quick look at some code that illustrates the concept of wrapping a presentational component with a container component. So let's go ahead and head back over to our editor. And you'll see that in our file system here, we have a JS folder. Inside of our JS folder, we have all the files for our application. So we have things like the application state type. We have the um, app store. We have the application itself. We have a file for our action types, the reducer, components, and actions. Okay. And we'll be making modifications to a number of these files throughout the course of the class. Uh, but for this part right here, we want to take a look specifically at these two components. We're importing React. We're importing the React DOM. We're pulling in this thing called Widget Table Container. This is actually going to be a container component. And you can see where we're actually passing our store here 
into this container component and then down here we're calling refresh widgets to actually refresh the widgets. Now let's come back over here to our file system and we'll go into our container and let's take a look at what it looks like. If we come down here, scroll down, you're going to see we have our widget table container, but then down here it references widget table. Now passing into our props we actually passed in, um, we actually passed in our store and we referenced that store over here but you'll notice we don't actually pass the store into the widget table itself. Instead, we're going to call get state on the store, which will return back to us the widgets, and then we're going to take those widgets and we're going to pass those widgets down into here. This is an example of taking a presentational component and wrapping it inside of a container. So while we're ultimately going to use React Redux later on to do this for us, this is an example of separating out or dividing our component into two pieces. One that focuses on the presentational aspects and one that focuses on communicating with the application's uh, environment, in this case the actual store of the application. If we come over to our actual widget table here, you'll see that this just deals with presentational stuff. It doesn't actually, um, it doesn't actually connect into the store, or know anything about the application itself. It just simply displays um, some UI stuff. As we saw in the previous section, using a container component to wrap our UI presentational components makes a whole lot of sense in terms of, in terms of creating presentational components that are very reusable across uh, multiple applications, as well as having a good separation of concerns. Um, one component's involved with actually interacting with the application resources. Another component focuses on displaying that information to the user and allowing the user to interact with it. Well, this has become such a popular combination of technologies, React and Redux, that there's actually a special package that we're going to learn how to use that will allow us to easily connect a React component to a Redux store ultimately programmatically producing a container component. Now one of the reasons why React and Redux work so well together is the whole notion of a single source of truth when it comes to information. If you've ever worked with a React component before, you know that props are always immutable and that if you need to mutate any type of information, you have to set up a state with, within a component itself. And so basically the props are passed in, they can be used to initialize the state if you want to. Then the props and state combined are used to actually render the UI piece, the user interacts with the UI piece, triggering an action. That action can then either pass data up to the parent component or the action can be used to uh, mutate the state. But, but everything always has a single source of truth. Um, you, never, you never directly uh, modify the props and those get passed up to the parent. For example, when you work with a controlled input field, you never type into the field itself. You type in, trigger an, an, an action or an event to occur and then the state is updated and then the UI piece is updated with the new, um, with the new state the, con the form control is. And so, and so Redux follows very similar principles to that. We never mutate the state, we always produce a new state. All, all new states are produced from actions and actions are always triggered from the UI and the UI is always populated from Redux. So it's a single source of truth, a one-way flow of data when doing Redux and Flux applications, that kind of thing. So React and Redux both use very similar principles to how they work with data within their respective systems. So tying the two of these together in terms of building application makes a whole lot of sense. Now, where does Redux fit into a React, uh, a React application? Um, because React components have the idea or notion of state, and Redux is all about managing or maintaining application state. It can be a little bit confusing about where Redux fits into this. Redux is going to be used to manage the application state, not necessarily each component's individual localized state. For example, on a controlled input field, when you type into the box, you have to have a, uh, a state property available inside of your component to capture the data that's typed in so that the state can be updated and then the component can be re-rendered 
with that new state data, thereby having the actual character show up in the input field. This type of state would not typically be captured or managed by Redux. This is not the state of the application, this is just the state of an input field. However, let's say I had a list of colors. That is the state of the application. That would be something that you would manage in Redux. So after you typed your new color into your input box and clicked add, then you would trigger an action to be dispatched that would have that new color data. It would add it to the list of colors stored in the application state. Then that application state would be passed down as props back into the component. And then the UI or the presentational component would then be updated. So the key to using React with Redux is making sure that we understand what React is managing versus what Redux is managing and then how to tie the two of those together. Now to work with React Redux, we're going to have to install the NPM package called React Redux. We're also going to be installing the typings file. Since we're using TypeScript, you don't have to use TypeScript. You can use plain old regular JavaScript if you'd like. But because we are using TypeScript, we're going to install the React Redux typings file. Unlike uh, Redux, which actually comes with the strong typing definitions built in, React Redux does not. So it has, you have to download it as an external uh, typings file. And then finally, because we're using System.js, we're going to register the React Redux package with our project in our System.js configuration. So let's take a quick look at a demo of how to configure our project to use the React Redux package with TypeScript. Let's go ahead and uh, update our project to make use of React Redux. So we'll open up our terminal window here and we're going to say npm i dash s react dash redux. This is going to go out and actually install it for us. Excellent. We're also going to now have to run our typing. So we'll say dash dot slash modules. Actually, we'll do uh, node modules backslash. I do a lot of stuff on Mac and uh, Linux, so uh, get used to doing those forward slashes like that. Typings, install, react, redux, and we'll actually go ahead and save this too. Excellent. All right, we now have our typings installed. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to come over to our system.js. And we're going to update that in our index file. There we go. So we'll collapse that. We're going to come down here and actually add our reference in here for React Redux. So we'll say React Redux colon. Now we need to specify our path. This is going to be starting off of the node modules folder with our npm slash and then we're going to have React Redux. But then we actually have to come over to our node modules and make sure that we know what this path is to actually get to the actual file that we want to use. So we'll come over to node modules, expand this out a little bit, scroll down to React Redux. There's our React Redux, come down to the dist, and there's React Redux min. So it follows the same structure as the other ones. Now, these will not necessarily always follow the same structure. It, it works fine here for this, but don't make that assumption when using system.js for doing module stuff with other libraries. Always double check those paths. React Redux.min.js. And there we go. So now we have installed the React Redux package. We have installed the typings for it. And finally, we've registered it with System.js. So now that we have our React Redux package installed, it's time to take a look at the API for actually uh, setting up our presentational components to actually talk to Redux. Uh, the React Redux package actually provides a function called connect. And what connect is going to do is it's going to allow us to establish a mapping from the application state to the presentational component props, as well as set up the actual dispatch functions for the various actions that can be triggered. 
and it's going to wire those up as props to be passed into the presentational component so they can be invoked from there. And it's going to take those mappings combined with our top level presentational component and basically wrap a container component around that. So the container component will then know about the Redux store through the mappings and how to pass the data down, but the presentational components won't have to understand the actual implementation details of how all that works. So here's the connect function API. Um, the first argument is going to be a function, which is going to map the application state to the props that are being passed into the, um, in, into the presentational component. So if you take a look here at the map to map state to props function, you'll see there's a state being passed into the function. That is in fact the actual application state provided by Redux. And then we have a mapping of the properties of the state to, um, to the actual props that are being passed into that presentational component. Next you'll see we have another function called map dispatch to props. And this is actually going to take an object that has properties that points to action creator functions, and it's going to bind those to the actual dispatch function provided by the Redux store. The mapping is going to result in the creation of a bunch of wrapper functions that will then be passed in as props to that presentational component where they can be invoked, triggering the actions that then update the store. Next we have the merge props. This is just going to be an object of other props that we can pass into our presentational component. So we're not limited to only passing in the application state or the dispatch functions. We can actually pass in additional properties as well. Now when you call connect, the result of calling connect is an actual function object. That function object will then be invoked, allowing us to pass in the presentational component, which will then create that wrapping container component will be the result of that function call. In order to understand how all of this plays into uh, populating our presentational uh, components props, we need to take a step back and talk about data as it's used in a React component. Most React developers learn early on in their, in their React development that there's two types of data when we think of React components. There's something called props and something called state. Props are passed in from the parent component and they're immutable. State, on the other hand, is managed locally within a component and it can be mutated through the set state function call. And while all of that is true, it's actually quite helpful to divide our props up into two additional categories, data and events. For our React Redux application, data props are going to basically be supplied with data from the Redux uh, store's application state, and it's going to be displayed through the presentational components. So think of a list of colors. The second kind of props, event props, are going to actually be used to trigger actions that will be dispatched into the store. So if we have a list of, of colors as our data, then the action to actually add a color to the list would be an example of one of these event props or action props that will also be, also be passed into our presentational component so that in, our, in this example, new colors could be added to the list. Now, most of the event props, at least in terms of talking about React and Redux, they are going to indirectly trigger the dispatch function of the Redux store. One of the things that this wrapping of the presentational component does is it allows us to actually produce functions that are automatically mapped to that dispatch function so that when they're invoked from the presentational component, they do in fact actually dispatch the action to the correct Redux store. Now, when mapping our application state to component props um, with the connect function, we're going to be passing in a function called map state to props. Usually in small applications, this map state to props is simply going to receive the application state object from Redux, grab some of the properties, assign them to the props, and they'll be passed in. But there's nothing that limits this function to being that simple. It can actually have some logic and stuff like that in it. The thing you have to be careful about, though, is, this, this, is that this function will be executed a lot. Just like your reducer functions inside of the store, this is going to be, um, this is going to be executed every single time an action is fired off. So you want to make sure that whatever kind of mapping you're doing, it's fast. Otherwise, you could definitely impact the performance of the application.
Next, we have our map dispatch to props. This is also going to be another function. In its most simplistic form, it's basically going to be taking all of your action creators, binding them to the Redux store's dispatch function, and then simply returning back an object of those, of those functions. However, once again, you can also write additional code and do additional logic if you want to, to perform this mapping. However, unlike the map state to props, the map, the map dispatch to props function only runs one time. This is why there's actually two separate functions for doing these operations. The map state to props will run every single time there's a new application state being dispatched. The map dispatch to props will only run the initial time that the wrapping container is actually created. So while we want to make sure that all of our JavaScript performance is always really good, Performance in terms of this function being executed over and over and over again like map state to props, the performance of this function is not as critical because it only runs the one time. So let's take a look at this mapping flow here real quick. We're basically going to have our application state data and our actions bound to the dispatch function are going to be combined together to populate our props object. Now the actions and the application state are both going to come from the Redux store. Then we're going to merge that with our other props for, um, that we just simply want to pass into our, to our container. Finally, these are being passed into our top-level presentational component that's being provided to us by React. So let's take a quick look at a demonstration of how to connect a React component to a Redux store using the Connect API. So let's take a look at how we can take this widget table container and actually set it up using the connect API instead of doing this manual approach that we have here. So I'm going to come up here and actually close our index.html file and we'll come over here and collapse our folder menu. And we're going to go ahead and reduce the font size by one so we can kind of see a little bit more code here on the screen. And we're going to come in here and kind of change this code around a little bit in order to use the connect API. So the first thing we're going to do here up at the top is instead of pulling in the store type for um, from Redux now, we're going to instead pull in something called bind action creators and we're going to pull in the dispatch type. After we pull those in, we're going to pull in our React Redux library. So we'll say import. And from the React Redux library, we're first going to pull in connect then we're going to pull in two interfaces imap dispatch to props and imap uh, state to props from react redux there we go now, remember with TypeScript, you get really good IntelliSense. So if you did not remember what these interfaces were, you could have done the from React Redux first, then actually would have gotten IntelliSense for the actual interface names. I'm going to take our app state right here, and I'm going to pull it out of there and move it up there like that. And then I'm going to pull in our refresh widgets function. So we'll say import refresh widgets from and then our refresh widgets is inside of our actions folder so we'll go up a folder and then say actions slash refresh widgets there we go okay so now we have all the things imported that we need to go ahead and set this conversion up to build out the rest of this, we're actually just going to delete all of this code right here. And now we can set up our two mapping functions and then work with our connect API. So the first function we're going to set up is our map state to props. And this is going to be of type I map state to props. And we're going to pass into this our actual state. So we'll say state colon app state. 
And then for this, we're going to have a simple mapping, simply returning back our widgets. And then we'll have state.widgets. So there's our first one. So we have our strong typing set up for map state to props, and then our strong typing set up for our state. The next one is going to be map dispatch to props. And there we go with that. We have our, our interface for that. And then here we're going to actually pass in a reference to the dispatch function. And then we'll say dispatch. And then for this, we're gonna, it's, it's going to be a generic, so we're going to pass in our state like this. And then the result of this is simply going to be a call to bind action creators. We're going to pass in our refresh widgets reference there and then pass in our dispatch reference here. The final step is going to be to actually set up the widget container again or the widget table container. So we'll say export const widget table container type of widget table. And then we're going to say connect map state to props, map dispatch to props, and then pass into it widget table. So let's do a quick summary of our changes that we've made here. We've set up a map state to props and map dispatch to props function. On map state to props, we're going to take the basically the widgets property off of the state and pass a reference to it on our prop that are going to be passed into our presentational component. On the map dispatch to props, we've taken the refresh widgets action, which actually makes a REST service request, download some widgets, and then makes them available to our components. Um, we've, we've taken this action and we've, we've basically bound it to the dispatch function using this bind action creators. That way, when the refresh widgets property is passed down into the component tree, um, we can invoke that function and it will actually invoke the proper dispatch function for actually having the action dispatched within the Redux store. Then finally we came down here to take to produce that same widget table container that we saw before um, except that now we're using the connect API and we're using these functions to establish the mappings between the Redux store and the actual presentational component which in this case is widget table. So now this same widget table container that we used before is now going to um, is now going to be wrapping widget table through the use of this convenient API. So now that we have our first wrapped container component, let's go ahead and talk about accessing asynchronous data. One of the great things about Redux is it provides a nice middleware interface for basically creating things that will make it easier to do certain operations in Redux, such as, in this case, accessing asynchronous data. When you access asynchronous data, you're basically going to be launching two actions to accomplish basically one operation. To help us do that, there's a special package called Redux Thunk. And Redux Thunk is going to make it very easy for us to basically coordinate those two actions so that we can then update the UI with the data that we receive from our asynchronous operation, typically an AJAX operation. Now you might be wondering where the word thunk comes from. The definition of thunk is that it's a function whose execution is delayed until later. Well, if you think about the nature of asynchronous operations and callback functions, when you think about callback functions, those are perfectly described by the definition of a thunk. So what's basically going to happen is we're going to take a single operation and we're going to divide it into two actions. The first action will be a request action. So go out and get the data and while it's being requested, we'll fire off the request action and then we can do something like display a spinner or some type of UI blocking mechanism so the user can't interact with the web page. The second action that's going to be fired off is once that asynchronous operation has completed, we're going to fire off a done action. Now, the use of the terms request and done are totally arbitrary. You can call these actions whatever you would like. For the purposes of this class and for our code demonstration, we'll call them request and done. But, but these are not terms that are fixed within the, within the Redux Thunk package uh, mechanism at all. It's just a convenient name for identifying those two actions. 
So basically, the request action um, occurs when the asynchronous operation uh, begins, and then the done action fires once the asynchronous operation completes. Now, managing these, these types of operations in Redux can be tricky, but the Redux Thunk package is going to make it easier for us to do. In order to use Thunk, we're going to have to uh, install the Redux Thunk package, and we're going to have to use the apply middleware function from Redux and actually use that to configure the Redux application store to use Redux Thunk. Now, to actually implement this is a bit tricky. What we're going to ultimately be doing is instead of having our action creator return back an action object, it's actually going to return back a function, a function which will receive a reference to the dispatch function as well as a reference to the get state function for the Redux store. Now what's going to happen is inside of this function that gets returned, this is where our two actions are going to be dispatched. The first one will be dispatched immediately, the request action. The second one will be embedded inside of some type of callback function, either triggered by a traditional callback mechanism or even a promise. And that will then dispatch the done action to process the results. Now the actual return value from this function which is returned back should be a promise so that anything that calls this function can actually chain, can be able to chain additional asynchronous operations off of it. So let's take a look at a synchronous action creator first and then we'll take a look at the asynchronous. So here we have an example of adding a car. So we have this function defined where we have a car passed into it and then the result of the function is an object that has two properties. One is type, which is going to then point to whatever the value of add underscore car is. And then we have the shorthand property car itself, which is going to be the actual data associated with the action. But let's take a look at what this Redux thunk asynchronous action creator looks like. Notice we have the same add car function, but now instead of returning back an action object, we're returning back a function. And this function, in this case, we're only interested in the dispatch uh, parameter. So we have the dispatch parameter named. And you can see the first thing the function does when invoked is to actually dispatch the request action. Then, using the fetch API, it's actually going to make an, an, uh, an asynchronous call back up to the server, an AJAX request. It's going to do whatever the operation is to actually add the car to the server. And then once that process is completed, we are then going to use that reference to the dispatch function once again to actually dispatch our add car done action. But you can see inside of this one function we're calling dispatch once. Once when we initiate and then once when we complete the asynchronous operation. Now take a look at in front of the actual fetch command itself. There's another return. This is going to be the actual object that's returned to wherever this add car function is actually invoked from. So when we actually call add car from one of the presentational components, that function will actually return the promise generated from the, uh, from the fetch followed by the two thens. So to get started with Redux Thunk, we're going to need to install that Redux Thunk NPM package. Once again, the typings are not actually bundled together with the package, so we have to install external typings. And then, of course, register the Redux Thunk package with System.js. So let's take a quick look at a demonstration of how to access asynchronous data with Redux Thunk. So now we're going to go ahead and wire this thing up to make use of Redux Thunk. First thing we're going to have to do is actually open up our terminal uh, window and actually install it first. So here's our terminal window. We'll say npm i-s redux thunk. Node modules backslash dot bin typings dash s. Actually install dash s. And we'll do redux thunk. And we'll go ahead and get that installed. There we go. And then we're going to come over to our index file. And we'll go ahead and add redux thunk over here.
npm slash redux func slash dist. Of course, we'll double check to make sure that our folder path is correct. There we go, same pattern as before. Okay, great, so now we have Redux Thunk added to our project. Now let's go ahead and start modifying our code to make use of it. First thing we're gonna do is we're actually gonna add a new folder underneath JS called Models. And we're gonna go ahead and set up an actual like model for our, for our widgets. So we'll say new file, widget.ts. Now, if your code doesn't have any JSX in it, you can actually just do a .ts extension. Um, if you do have JSX in your code, in order for TypeScript to know how to process it, it must have a TSX extension. Sometimes I'll just start naming all my files with TSX extensions. It's really probably better not to do that, um, but it, it, it works fine either way. Um, but in this case, we'll just call this widget.ts. So we're gonna come into here and actually export our class widget. There we go. And um, we are going to use some property declarations on this. So we'll say public ID number. This will give us some good IntelliSense and strong typing. We'll have string public description string public color string public size string public quantity number there we go there's our widgets model so we'll go ahead and save that now we're going to head back over to refresh widgets and this is where we're going to actually incorporate um, some of our code here for working with our thunk mechanism. Now, after we make our changes to refresh widgets, we can't forget to actually go back to the store and actually add the actual thunk library over there. It's, uh, it's very easy to forget to do that and do all the work over here but not make the changes over there. So now, inside of our refresh widgets, we no longer need access to the store. The reason we had access to the store before was because um, we needed the dispatch function to actually trigger our actual actions. If you come down here, our old refresh widgets actually needed that app store to call dispatch. But that's no longer going to be necessary because of the bind action creators we did in the last demo. So we can actually come into here and get rid of app store, but we are going to need the widget type because we're going to make this more strongly typed than it was before. So we'll say import widget from dot dot slash models slash widget. There we go. So now we have our widget being imported there. First change we're gonna make is we're gonna come into here and actually make this a strongly typed widget array. And we're gonna come down here to this widgets array and actually change this to be an array of type widget. Now that we have that done, we're gonna come down here and actually modify refresh widgets. Now this is where we're gonna get into that whole function returning a function thing. We don't have any parameters being passed in here. If let's say we had an actual action for adding a widget, the widget you were going to add would actually be passed in in this parameter here. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to create a new function and it's going to have the dispatch function. So there's our dispatch function. And we're going to return that like that. And then we're going to pull this code here. out of there, indent that, and now we can get rid of App Store. Because now that dispatch function reference is gonna be passed in from that uh, binding that we created with bind action creator. Now another change we're gonna make is we're actually gonna make a return statement here for this fetch. That way inside of our code later on we say um, uh, this.props.refresh widgets inside of our component the, re the return value of this dot props dot refresh widget will now be this promise object and so additional asynchronous or other operations could be chained off of that. Now coming into here we're going to make one additional little change which really doesn't have a whole lot to do with Redux Thunk 
but has a whole lot to do with our stronger typing that we're doing over here. We're actually going to come in here and we're going to say widgets.map and then we're going to have our widget. And then what we're going to do is we're going to say return new widget, just like this. And actually, instead of returning, we'll do a const w equal to new widget. And then we'll set all of our properties. So we'll say w.id is equal to widget.id. And let's take that s off of our widget there. w.name is equal to widget.name w.description is equal to widget.description w.color is equal to widget.color now you'll notice I don't have any IntelliSense here I could actually come up to here and actually set this up to be of type widget or I could come over to here and set this up to be an array of widgets. There we go. And so now I know that I'll get my, my widget here. And we'll make that error message go away by doing our return w down there. And then of course we'll continue on here doing our final properties. w.size is equal to widget.size. And then finally, w dot, um, w dot quantity is equal to widget dot quantity. So now we're actually producing actual widget objects. Um, so if you were to actually check to see if this widget was like an instance of, of the widget class, that would come back as true. And so now we're actually building actual widget objects. So far, so good. Um, the next step that we're going to do here is we're going to actually put a little space in there and we'll take out the space down here. There we go. So what we're going to do now is we're actually going to go set up our uh, Redux Thunk with our middleware on our actual um, store. So we'll come down here to App Store and we're going to import thunk from and we'll say uh, redux thunk and we'll actually pull this out pop that up here better to organize our actual uh, NPM modules separate from our um, the ones that are actually just code files in our application and then we're going to need to also pull in from redux apply middleware. So now we'll take our apply middleware function here and we'll go down to the next line for this and we're going to say apply middleware thunk. And so now we'll have support for Redux thunk within our application. The final thing that we need to do to actually bring all this to life is come over here to widget table and widget table needs a little bit of help in terms of making it work with all of this first thing we're going to do is we're going to import our widget type from models slash widget and then we'll come into here and we'll say widget like this Next, we need to actually set up our refresh action. So we'll say refresh action, and we'll give it a type of function there. Now, we could actually be more specific with this if we want. If you remember, the refresh action is actually going to return back an actual promise. So if we want to, we could come in here and do this and say promise. Of course, what's the promise going to be a type of? Um, it's going to be a type of an array of widgets. So we could say widget like this, and we can get really strongly typed um, IntelliSense there. So we'll go ahead and save that. Next thing we're going to want to do is make sure that we're actually properly doing our prop types and our default props. So we'll say static prop types equal to, and the first one is going to be refresh 
uh, widgets. Actually, that should be fresh widgets here. So refresh widgets here. And we're going to say react dot prop types dot func is required. And then of course we'll have our widgets. And this is going to be react dot prop types array of and then inside of here we're going to say react dot prop types dot instance of widget and we'll say is required. Alright, so we want to make sure that not only do we do our strong typing with our interfaces and stuff like that when working with React and TypeScript, our prop types are still also essential and make sure that we're actually setting those up as well. So the, the interface is going to check our typing at, um, at basically transpilation time and the prop types will check our typing at runtime when we're in a development environment. So we're also going to do static um, default props. So there we go. And then for this, we're just going to specify widgets as an array. So what that means is, is that you could basically pass in no widgets and you'd be fine, but you always have to supply the refresh widgets function that you see here. So coming down here now, we're going to go ahead and add in the uh, lifecycle function component did mount. And then for this, we're going to say this dot props dot refresh widgets. And of course, you can do then or whatever you wanted to afterwards if you wanted to, to run an additional operation after the promise was resolved. So we have this dot props dot refresh widgets. This is a lifecycle function. Notice we simply just call this function now, and now it's just going to go out and download our widgets. All the mapping to the dispatch function, all of the handling of the request action versus the done, all of that's already done for us. We don't have to know about that anymore. Uh, the, whole, the whole mappings mechanism just makes this function available to our presentational component, and our presentational component doesn't have to know any of the details of any of the implementation. It makes your life a whole lot easier. Now one little final thing here about TypeScript. Um, sometimes you'll see people come in and actually use the access modifiers like public and private and stuff like that. If you decide to do that, your prop types, default props and render all need to be public, but your component did mount your lifecycle functions can be private. Um, you don't have to make those public. But if you try to make um, render or default props or prop types private, then your React component's not going to work for you. The last thing we'll need to do before we can actually run this is because we're going to call refresh now and our component did mount, we no longer need to actually call refresh widgets here in our main file like we were doing before. And we can actually remove the reference to that and we'll save our code there. So our final step now is to actually go ahead and run our program. And let's see if it runs correctly for us or if we have to fix any bugs. Okay, so it looks like we have a bug in our code. Let's see what's going on here. So let's open up our developer tools and let's see what's going on. Let's see here. We have localhost, node modules. Ah, okay, it can't seem to find our Redux Thunk library. So let's see if we typed our path incorrectly. So let's come over to our editor. Let's go to index. And let's see if we typed in something wrong here. We have Redux dash Thunk. We have NPM. Ah, here's our problem. We typed in React Thunk. You got to be very careful about this because React and Redux both have are both five character words. They both begin with re. It's very easy when working with React versus React Redux or Redux, Redux Thunk, to mistype those. So let's go ahead and fix that real quick and save that. Come back over to our web browser and close these other windows. And let's go ahead and refresh. And let's see if we have some data. And we certainly do. So now we were able to actually use Redux Thunk in combination with React Redux 
to basically eliminate a lot of the boilerplate code for wiring up all of this asynchronous stuff and wiring up um, all of the dispatch, um, wiring up the dispatch function with the actual action creators and handling all the actual mapping of application state properties to the actual um, React presentational component props. So now we have our React Redux application working again, but using the React Redux library to make life a lot easier. At the outset of the course, we talked about that passing down the dispatch functions and other uh, application state uh, through a tree of container components could be very tedious and actually a fair amount of work. Fortunately, React has a feature called context which can help us uh, solve this problem, make it, make it a lot easier to work with Redux. The problem with context though is that while it's a powerful and useful feature, it's also easily abused. It's basically the equivalent of a global scope for your tree of React components. And like, like most things that are powerful in the hands of inexperienced React developers, um, a lot of anti-patterns can result. Uh, the problem with global variables in general is that people will use globals thinking that it's the easier way or the only way of solving the problem of how to pass data into something. And the problem is with React, the, the idea behind React is that we're really trying to build things that are as close to a pure function as possible. So we want our, our props, which are the parameters to that function, to be passed in. We don't want those props to be mutated. We want to have the function do something and return back a result, which in this case is the UI. And then, and then when, when we interact with the UI or the user interacts with the UI, we want to trigger events that properly update data in the parent and then pass the updated information back down as, as props once again. That whole process, especially for a new React developer, can be pretty challenging for them to master. So what happens is if they were to use something like context, they might skip that entire mechanism and instead just use context to make all of this data globally available. Well, the problem is once you start depending upon context, you start to violate all of the fundamental principles of using React to begin with. That being said, there are times when practical considerations come into play. And this is one of those times. And context, when used properly, is a great way to share a Redux store with your tree of container components. Now, as mentioned a moment ago, typically, we always want to implement our React components as closely as possible to being pure functions. We want to have a bunch of immutable props be passed in, generate some type of UI as our return value, and then use events to send data back up to parent components, which can then update state and then send down new information back through the props, and then they can be displayed by our React components. To help prevent the unintentional pollution of the context um, uh, by our React components, React requires that we explicitly define um, what values are going to be shared via context. And this, this explicit definition has to be defined in two places. One, on the component that is the source of the data for the context, and then also on each component that desires to use that data off of the context. This will allow us to safely and intentionally use the context specifically for the pieces of data that we want to use it for. In this case, the Redux store. Also, context data is always immutable, like props data. Never, ever, ever modify um, context data. Choosing to use the context, in this case, is going to introduce an external dependency upon our container components. Now, even though we don't typically like to introduce these external dependencies, in some cases, such as this one, we can make an architectural or design decision to go ahead and do this, and we just understand that we're going to be accepting this limitation. Now, this is not such a big deal with React Redux because React Redux container components are automatically configured out of the box to check the context for the Redux store. 
So we're not we're not really hurting ourselves all. We're not really hurting ourselves at all by doing this in our application because we're already using the React Redux library. Nevertheless, when you choose to use context for this purpose or any other, do recognize you are introducing an external dependency that could limit the reusability or impact the testing of your component. Now using this context to share the Redux store is so common that the React Redux package actually provides a container component named Provider. And Provider has a store prop on it that allows us to basically assign the Redux application store. Now all container child components of this Provider component will be able to access a store through the context and then they can make the appropriate properties and dispatch functions off of that store available to their child presentational components. Now it is worth mentioning that child um, that the child presentational components should never ever ever directly access the Redux store whether it's through the context or through props or whatever the actual child component should never should never be referencing the store directly they should always be referencing it through the mapped uh, the mapped uh, state and the map dispatch functions to the props. Here's a quick little diagram. So, if in the on the left hand side, if we were not using the provider component, you can see where every container store has to have a reference to the store passed into it. However, when using the provider wrapper, you can see we can assign the store to the provider, and then it's instantly available to all of the containers. When you have a rather large tree of components and you want an effective way to share that store, the provider component really helps, especially in situations where you could be providing a container component through some type of API and, and it'll automatically be hooked into that provider store and that can be very useful. So let's take a quick look at a demonstration of how to share the Redux store using the provider React component. So for the final step of our application, we're going to pass the actual store into the provider component instead of directly passing it into our container components. Now in our simple little application, passing the store directly into our one container component is not a big deal. But if we had a tree of container components, um, passing that store uh, all the way down the tree would be a real pain. So we can use the provider component, which will use the context underneath the hood to actually pass that store down for us. So we'll come back over here to our editor, and we're going to go to the file app.tsx, and we're going to come in here and actually import the provider. So we'll say import provider from React Redux, there we go. And then now instead of, so now instead of passing the store directly into the container component, we are instead going to wrap this with the provider component. And we're going to say store equal to app store. And then we'll come into here and delete that. and we'll close that off there and we'll go ahead and save this and our file has changed as we can see down here so we should be able to go back over to our web browser and we'll reload it just to be on the safe side and now you can see that using the provider uh, component has passed the store down but has passed it down through the context instead well, that concludes our course. We've taken a look at how to use Redux with React and demonstrated how it's a great solution for connecting our application state to our presentational components through the use of container components. Um, there's a special API called Connect that actually produces those container components for us, allowing us to specify mapping functions for mapping the application state as well as various action creators to our presentational components. 
And we also introduced Redux Thunk, which is a commonly used piece of middleware that allows us to do asynchronous operations. And then finally, we took a look at how to easily share the Redux store across a component tree to all the container components through the use of the provider component.